this is like, you know, the U.S. Congress just had this this big announcement, like you know, a bipartisan China committee. But if you look at the details of what that bipartisan China committee is going to do, it's not legislative. It's really just investigative. So they're going to ha- they're going to conduct investigations and they're going to maybe hear testimony, but it's like you said, it, that's a tactical approach. And that's on ba- barely tactical there, but it's it's not strategic because it's not actually addressing the core of the problem and how to change that relationship. It's just going to discuss problems little, little that have occurred. Steps, little problems that have addressed this. You know, in the 90s, uh, my first book came out called Chinese Intelligence Operations. And for that, I actually interviewed about nine Ministry of State Security officers and recruited assets. So it was a very big deal at the time. I testified before Congress a number of times. And on the way out, one of the last testimonies, I said, you know, regarding economic espionage, I said, do something about this now. Because if you don't do something about this now, you'll be calling me back in 20 years crying, my God, how did it get this bad? And you know what? It's 25 years later, and that's exactly where we are. But did, did oh. they call you back, though? No, <laughs> they didn't. So, I mean, I think I think a lot of the issue is like, because like you said, like, where where do these officials see 10 years from now? And, th- and they can't even imagine that because it, it goes back to, we, we talk about this a lot, how uh, uh, like there's this resistance to identify the Chinese Communist Party as a Marxist-Leninist state that considers itself at war with the United States. And so until you can like approach this as, oh, this is actually an enemy that needs to de- be defeated. Right, and accept you, and accept that they're not going to change themselves. Exactly, yeah. Then you just can't make that goal of like, oh, what is 10 years from now going to be like? We had the same arguments in the 90s. And, um, you know, sev- myself, many other scholars and, uh, and you know, congressional members and things like that, even Nancy Pelosi at the time, uh, were very understanding of the, um, of the nature of the CCP. And ultimately, over time, that sort of got shouted down with this belief that, oh, once they get exposed to money and freedom and capitalism, you know, they're going to be our best buddies. And and that philosophy has proven wrong. And Xi Jinping surely buried it. Money is the root of all goodness, as they say. Yeah. In the 90s was that key moment, right, where Bill Clinton wanted to, well, he was under a lot of pressure from U.S. companies, right? To, well, there was also lots of shady things going on with the Clintons in China. Yeah, oh, that's th- that may be true. But even that aside, mm-hmm. right, there was tremendous pressure from Wall Street to open up the China market, get China into the WTO. And I think that, that like, obviously they were wrong about the, you know, making China liberalize, but like... Was there any awareness of, like, were companies even thinking about risks of technology transfer, or was that not even, like, on the radar at the time? It wasn't even on the radar. In fact, to this day, it's only half on the radar. Um, I'm surprised how uh, how little, I mean, some of the cases that you hear about, um, which I'm not at liberty to actually go into detail, but some of the, the cases that you hear about where technology was stolen from a, a large U.S. corporation. I mean, the U.S. corporation had absolutely almost nothing in place to protect that technology. I mean, it's still investing in your security, investing in insider threat is um, is taking money away from the bottom line, right? So people don't want to do that. And you get this uh, this recurring cycle where the security people are crying that the sky is falling and the senior executives don't want to hear it because adding into that security apparatus reduces the bottom line for companies. So we, we do have this dynamic tension that's in place. Uh, and then the question is, well, what's, you know, the risk? I mean, I've, I've looked at companies that have lost 400 million uh, in research and development to China. And, you know, and they're just, well, do we have to worry about it now that it's out the door? I, I don't know how to answer questions like that. So it's um, so you, you do have those those problems in the business world that have yet to be reconciled, but also like the it's kind of unfair in a certain way because what's happening in China 
it sounds like is the Chinese Communist Party through the government and through its MSS and through you know this whole society approach is conducting espionage against U.S. corporations, right? But the U.S.'s approach is not a whole of society defense even, right? So like even the basketball metaphor of just being on defense is not enough because it's it's being on defense, but you've only got three players and the other team has 1,200. And I'm the guy in the audience with a gun. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. And that's, the, that's a key point um, that the U.S. is not structured I mean, our intelligence services, our security services are just not structured to contend with this threat. Um, I train a lot of U.S. government agencies. And what I say is, you know, I'm not really concerned about you folks, because the simple truth is you're going to do what you always do. You're going to circle the wagons, throw a bunch of blankets on top of your secrets and say, yay, we're safe. But for the rest of corporate America, that's the real target of this. They're not safe. And they're the ones that are under siege. And our government is just minimally structured and and adjusting to try and help those, you know, which which typically winds up to a once a year FBI briefing. You know, I I could tell you more, but it's classified. Uh, But if you see anything suspicious, call me. Here's my card. And, uh, you know, just the numbers of cases that are ongoing, just it's a ridiculous way to approach the problem. I mean, Director Ray of the FBI said that they had one case every 12 hours a new one that would come up. That's what, 730 cases a year, per year, over 56 field offices, okay? If you were to try and address it through arresting your way out of this, you'd you'd have to increase your agents tenfold. It just isn't possible. The U.S. government has got to do better. Well, I think what's even crazier about the situation is, I mean, besides for... American companies being stupid and the U.S. government being stupid. Uh, It's not as if these Chinese spies are like these, you know, ultra-trained super soldiers. They're not like Jason Bourne, James Bond. No, no. Like, according to your report, most of them are are untrained. Yep. Yep, they they are untrained. Sometimes we, I I have what I call pockets of excellence. Sometimes you'll see some very good trade craft, very good training, um, but most times not. Like, like, what's a stupid example? Um, a stupid example is a, um, a, one of my favorites, a guy who was uh, an approached American company to try and secure radiation-hardened chips, which were ultimately going to go to state-owned enterprises and missile and space systems, right? That's why you get radiation-hardened chips. They're about 2700 apiece. This guy was out of England, uh, Liverpool, and he was running a fake company from the address of his restaurant, and, but he was in contact with a, with a Chinese government official and was moving money from them to his restaurant or to his fake company. And he came to the United States as he was talking with, the, with one of the three foundries that produce these in the United States. And he said, um, uh, yeah, well, we want these chips. Well, what are they being used for? Um, radi- uh, radar detectors in cars. Well, you know, our, our other chips at about 60 bucks a piece We'll be absolutely fine for that. No, no, no. This is the perfect chip. This is what we want at twenty seven hundred apiece. So it's just these ridiculous things. And of course, when he came to make the deal, Homeland Security was waiting for him. And uh, as he took it, and they had found out he was sending him to his restaurant and his connections with a Chinese government official. They had meetings in Thailand. Uh, you know, the whole scheme was actually revealed when they were all meeting in Thailand. And this is just ridiculous. They sent a guy who didn't know what the chips were for, um, who was paying an astronomical amount, you know, a quarter of a million dollars for chips, you know, for with a ridiculous cover story. So th- those are the kind of stupid situations you can run into. So why would somebody who obviously is untrained, doesn't know what they're doing, want to do that kind of spying for China? Well, there are two reasons that actually three that come up. Um, one is serve the motherland. And I've seen a number of cases like that where people want to do it to support China, serve the motherland. Um, two is in a case like this where it's maybe a one time deal, the cash benefit, you know, just doing it for the cash. Most often, these types of cases are done uh, to establish a business in China. Right to move either moving back or sending the vaccines back, which we've seen with Pfizer recently. 
um, to actually start production and start a business in China. So those are the three motivation factors. 